Good afternoon. Who in this audience enjoys skiing, snowboarding, hiking, snowshoeing? Yeah, right. Keep your hands up if you know of someone who's been caught in an avalanche. Keep your hand up if it's yourself. Yeah, we have a number of people in our audience that have been affected by avalanches. Avalanches are a really unique natural hazard. In 90% of avalanche accidents, the victim or a member of the victim's party causes the accident. And that's really unique compared to other natural hazards. That's very unlike a tsunami or an earthquake. It also means that we have a role to play. It means that we can do something about it through our choices. If we look at the avalanche fatalities over the last 10 years especially, we see that on average about 28 people die in avalanches every year in the USA. That's 28 people that don't come home to their families. That's 28 families without a dad, a mom, a brother, or a sister. That's too many. We can do better. When we look at who's involved, we also know that we're missing something. So what do we do? Well, teaching total avoidance is one option. But we all know that teaching abstinence simply doesn't work. <laughs> so rather than going down that track, what we want to do is teach people how to make the right observations, to pick up the right information, to understand what the snowpack is telling them, and make the right choices. We typically do that through avalanche education. We take students into the mountains, we dig holes in the snow, and we look at the layered structure of the snowpack. And this is absolutely critically important because we need to understand the medium we're working on. However, when we go back to our avalanche fatalities, we see that we're still killing 28 people per year or so. And that's too many. And when we drill down into who those people are, we see that in many cases, they are people that had that information, that knew about the snowpack, that knew about the avalanche terrain. So what we need to ask ourselves is what is it that we're missing? What is it that we can provide in future education? What is it that we as snow scientists and as researchers need to do to try and bring that number down? What can we bring to the table? On the 5th of January, 2015, I received a phone call. It's the sort of phone call that you really never want to get. And the phone call informed me that, unfortunately, one of my snow science students, Olivia Buchanan, 23-year-old undergraduate, had been killed in an avalanche in southern Colorado. Olivia was one of those students I knew. She made sure of it. She came into my office probably on the first day at MSU and told me who she was, what she was doing, why she was there, and where she wanted to go. And on top of that, she was taking avalanche courses and building her backcountry experience. Olivia was not one of those students I was worried about. I thought of her as a pretty cautious person. While we'll never know exactly what happened and why exactly Olivia died, what we can see is that she probably knew enough about the snowpack and about the avalanche terrain. And maybe it was a critical decision point that went wrong. The human factor. So her death, and unfortunately others after that, really motivated me to think about this problem a little bit more broadly. To say, we need to understand the snow, we need to understand the terrain, but we also need to understand how and where and why people make decisions in that environment. So her death was really a big turning point in my personal research career, and I'm also hoping in the research direction of where we as avalanche scientists go, to better connect the physical and the human to bring down that fatality rate a little bit further. Now, I'd like to say I'm the first person to think of that, but I'm not. Other people have been thinking down this line before. Ian McCammon, about 15 years ago, did a fantastic study that looked at 504 fatalities over 30 years and identified these key heuristics, these shortcuts in decision-making that were correlated to avalanche deaths. While that work was extremely important, there's only so much we can learn by looking at fatalities. So what's the answer? 
Well, myself and Professor Johnson from political science at Montana State University started a new project called the Ski Tracks Project. And the idea behind this project that we've been running now for the last four years is to understand the connection of where people are in the backcountry, how they move in that terrain, and what decisions they're making. And this is what it looks like. We ask people to get out in the mountains, and they might, with a GPS or with their smartphone, make a track like that. And you can see there's two different tracks on there, and they're under slightly different circumstances. And from that track, we can pull out some terrain metrics, we can also pull out a survey, and we can connect all of those pieces together to understand what decision-making they are making and what's influencing their decision-making. When we look at some of that data a little bit more carefully, we can see that people under certain circumstances are making vastly different decisions, not as a function of the terrain and the avalanche conditions, but rather as a function of who they are and what group they're in. Now, if this sounds familiar to any of you, this isn't rocket science. We often see that people in different social circumstances make different choices when presented with the same physical evidence. For example, we see that all male groups behave differently than all female groups in the same terrain with the same hazard, but as a function of their group composition. We see especially all younger male groups using riskier terrain than, say, older female groups. Who's surprised by that? Anyone? <laughs> All right. So we are quantifying the obvious, okay? But we're quantifying it in this setting where we're seeing these fatalities happen. So while this work has given us some insight about who these people are and critically where they're going and maybe a little bit of insight around their decisions that they're making, it leaves us unsatisfied. And it leaves us unsatisfied because we don't understand the why. And we need to understand the why to help make better decisions. So we started a new project, which just started this year, and it combines our team with a behavioral economist from Norway, a lady by the name of Andrea Manberg. And what we're doing in this project is we're taking a behavioral economics lens to this issue. And what's really great as a snow scientist connecting with a behavioral e economist on this is that we can use decades of theory to look at this problem. They've been doing this for years. We're just starting out thinking about this. And by taking this lens, maybe we can better understand why people make these decisions, not just where they go. Some of the preliminary work that we're seeing already is showing that even with education, people's foundational risk appetite or their propensity to choose or prefer certain terrain is unchanged. So what's, what that's telling us is that we need to dig a little bit deeper. We need to do more than just tell people, this is the snow, this is the terrain, but maybe we need to look a little deeper in ourselves and into our students to understand what truly motivates them and what motivates their risk-taking appetite and their desires. If we can do this successfully, and we can pull these pieces together, and we can bring this into a format that's teachable for future generations, maybe we can bring down the avalanche fatality rate. Maybe we can understand why people are doing things and where they're doing things to bring in some intervention and make sure that more people do not die in avalanches in the future. We do that by connecting that GPS track, that view from above, with those decision-making aspects. So I want to leave you with a thought. The next time you go into the mountains and you go snowmobiling or hiking or extreme snow angeling <laughs> or maybe just skiing, think about what your track looks like from 10,000 feet up. Look down on your track. Think about the critical decision points and think about what that says about your risk tolerance and your risk behavior. And maybe by taking that 10,000 foot view and looking down, maybe you'll make a little bit different decision. Maybe you'll choose a slightly different line. Maybe you'll think more carefully about where you are in that terrain and how that expresses your risk and your risk tolerance. And maybe by taking that view, you'll make it home tonight and you'll see your family and so will your friends. This is my take on redefining the avalanche problem. Thank you.